Welcome to everybody. I'm honored to be here with you today. I would like to thank very much the organizers of this conference for having accepted my presentation and for giving me the opportunity to discuss with you the results of a study that has been recently published in the Journal of Phenomenological Psychology. Well, as Professor Weber said, my speech is entitled Adult Male to Female Transsexualism, a Clinical Existential Phenomenological Inquiry. In this study, I have reread and I will discuss with you today M2F transsexualism, as this condition is commonly called, in the light of Ludwig Binswanger's theories of manierism and Jean Paul Sartre's observations on the self, the body, the real, and the imaginary. In a certain sense, the aim of my paper is to offer an alternative to the dominant discourses surrounding this issue. In any case, before starting my presentation, I think that I should make some preliminary remarks. First of all, my mother tongue is not English, so I hope you will forgive me for my imperfect pronunciation. Secondly, I will read my speech because, as you can imagine, I'm a little nervous. Finally, more importantly, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a psychiatrist, but I forgot my pills. Uh, in a certain sense, today, I hope to have the chance to look again at my analysis, the way I've made use of Jean Paul Sartre's thought, in short, to rethink of transsexualism as an existential possibility. So, first of all, let's try to define what has been the subject of my inquiry. Male to female transsexualism manifests itself in the form of a subjective experience of discrepancy between the male sex assigned at birth and the subjective experience to be of belonging to the female gender, which in many, but not all cases, also involves a somatic transition by cross-sex hormone treatment and genital surgery. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the last edition of which dates back to two years ago, considers this condition as a possible expression of a broader taxonomic category, gender dysphoria, the main diagnostic criterion is a marked incongruence between one's experienced slash expressed gender and assigned gender of at least six months duration. Well, what I shall endeavor to show here today is not, in effect, in such cases, solely and simply a transcendence or the contingent nature of what is a given bodily anatomy referable to the difference between the sexes, the rising up of an individual both their own factistic facticity through technical advancement. More precisely, it, doesn't, it is not only this, but rather a specific, a more complex existential way of being, a specific world design, a specific form of being the world. All of my conclusions and theoretical remarks emerged from a focus on first-hand accounts of adult male-to-female transsexual experience, apart from some fragments of interviews published elsewhere the work was conducted primarily on a collection of ten autobiographical stories gathered from Popra Marcasciano, a sociologist and a leading exponent of the most important Italian organization aimed at defending transsexual rights. Obviously, I will not dwell on the methodological aspects of my research. Rather, I will outline the most salient results, looking in particular to point out the way I put to work the thought of Jean-Paul Sartre and Ludwig Binswanger. No doubt, this existential condition involves different and complex topics, such as personal identity and its relationship with gender identity. But what is gender identity? And more exactly, what do we exactly mean when we talk about one's experienced slash expressed gender? Well, I think that a good starting point is what Sartre had to say with regard to the differences between, between the real and the imaginary. As you obviously know much better than me, Sartre used the term real to indicate the coefficient of adversity in things. So, in a certain sense, the anatomy of the body can be referred to this domain. On the other hand, he described the imaginary as an attitude of consciousness, which he distinguished from the perceptive domain of consciousness. Perception, he had to say, is always necessarily incomplete. The object never appears except in a series of profiles. On the contrary, imagination is total. Imaginary objects, he says, cannot teach us anything. They come from a synthesis of our knowledge and our intention toward them. 
Now, these remarks are quite relevant. Whenever I try to question M12 people about what they mean exactly when they refer to the inner feeling of belonging to the opposite sex or gender, somehow they have been surprised, even astonished, by my question, and, and with evident difficulty replied simply offering examples of their favorite activities. But this is not exclusive to M12 transsexual people. After all, for all of us, it is extremely difficult to define our being male or female. Referring to Sapien thought, our sexual gender, in a certain sense, appears total, immediate. As is said in his being nothingness, man, it is said, is a sexual being because he possesses a sex. And if the reverse were true, if sex were only the instrument, and so to speak, the image, of fundamental sexuality, and of the quotation. So, probably, for all of us, our gender is similarly developed, also on an imaginary register. But, in a certain sense, just to say, it is balanced by the real, at least by the wholly considered structure of the body, the body as a mechanism and instrument. But, this is not enough. Just a little earlier, Sartre had this to say. Of course, one may consider that it is contingent for human reality to be specified as masculine or feminine. Of course, one may say that the problem of sexual differentiation has nothing to do with that of existence, since men and women equally exist. Th these reasons are not wholly convincing. That sexual differentiation lies within the domain of facticity, we accept without reservation. But does this mean that the for itself is sexual accidentally by the pure contingency of having this particular body? The fundamental problem of sexuality can therefore be formulated thus. Is sexuality a contingent accident bound to our physiological nature? Or is it a necessary structure of being for itself for others? So, to recap the indications that appear to come from the certain text, gender identity seems to lie somewhere between the facticity of the body, the imaginary, and in the subjective domain. Having established this and referring to the transsexual condition, I will first consider the relationship between the real of the body and the imaginary, and secondly, the importance of the intersubjective arena. The relationship bet between the real of the body and the imaginary is well depicted in the words of Nadia, one of the people interviewed by Popper Makashama. This is what she had to say. When I was younger, in a certain sense, I also suffered because I wanted to be a woman I and I wanted to have children. But over time, I have accepted most of the reality, but it has cost me so much. Let's say there has been a bit of frustration, well, a great deal of frustration. I couldn't say envy, but how can I say I suffered from not being a woman? I could not envy a woman, but I suffered because I wasn't one. That is the biggest frustration for a transsexual. I never thought, however, of having a sex change operation. For me, it's just castration, and I don't want that. I can be more feminine, but not female. And I, and I can do that even if I keep my male genital, genital organs. Being a woman implies other things, like being a mom, for example. And then, if I had the operation, I could be just an analogy. And that would be an even bigger frustration, certainly not a personal achievement. For me, even if you can't, it is just a can't. Apparently, you can look like a woman, but you are a woman without a womb, just an analogy. And at that point, what do you do? Again, one of the people whom Giulia Macorati, an Italian researcher, interviewed a few years ago for Nurse Day of Earth, had the following to say on the subject. The top, for its transsexual, is to be woman with capital W, not just a woman. It is what a man sees in a woman, because transsexual think with a man's brain. Very interesting is what Katie, another person, um, which was interviewed by Popper Marcasciano, had to say. At that point, I told myself that if I had begun the job, it would be better to complete it in the best possible way. So I thought I did well to turn to a good plastic surgeon, 
to tweak my nose, lips, breast. I fix all those parts that I wanted to be right. In fact, today the work done satisfies me fully. I'm the one I'd always dreamed of being, the beautiful buxom and battery blonde Viking, a figure that greatly resembles those women I've always taken as role models for a variety of physical and intellectual qualities. One is, is Kim Basinger, Nordic, romantic, a dreamer, the femme fatale that I've always dreamed of being. I've seen nine and a half weeks time and again, even in slow motion, trying to uncover the secrets of her appeal, to imitate, to reproduce it in my fantasies. Another model of woman that I really like is Alba Parietti, but also Valeria Marini, both considerably surgically retouched, beautifully curvy, or as I say, battery. Let's say that I try to reproduce these models of femininity, a femininity linked to sensuality, the classical charm, a showy femininity. Well, it would appear clear that we're acting here on the register of the imaginary. In certain terminology, where M to F transsexual need is an analogy that is a mental image of femininity they conjure with a think or their own possible body transformation. In this sense, the body itself becomes an analogon based on a studied model reduced to recipes to schemas. At the same time, as Sartre states in the, the transcendence of the ego, if the me appears through the reflective act and as a pneumatic correlative of reflexive intention, then the influence of preconceived ideas and social factors here becomes preponderant in determining its qualities. Well, here femininity is the signifier that models the male to female transsexual body. Just as I have observed in my lengthy clinical experience, in many cases here the body is used as a plastic material purposed for continual redesign and pursuit of a logic guided by subjection to an imaginary ideal of femininity, an ideal to which individuals wish to devote themselves in an asymptotic and irrealizing movement. Well, it is exactly the importance of this mental image that made me think of the Binswangeran remarks regarding mannerism. Arthur Tatosian summarized Binswanger's idea, ideas about mannerism as follows. This is what he said. Mannerism is the act of raising oneself thanks to something outside oneself. And mannerism presence promotes the peripheral and the exterior. If, if it is true that artistic mannerism requires something other than itself of a general type that is already crystallized in public life, then in the same way a mannered person seeks a template with which to recast himself or herself, a model of stability in everyday life in the sphere of the anonymous, the day, in Heideggerian terms, as a general type. Mannerism is not the existence beneath the mask, it is existence like and in the mask. If a mannered person chooses to be a mask, it is because the presence without habitation, without autonomy, involves the unbearable domain of anguish, doubt and desperation instead of trust. The anthropological lack of proportion in mannerism lies somewhere between the being the self and being anonymous, without ever reaching the balance maintained by the healthy presence. Well, just a parenthesis. Does it not sound very similar to Jean-Paul Sartre's remarks on that fate? In any case, I think that mannerism can actually be referred to m f transsexuals, the preference granted to exteriority and the peripheral, but above all the topic of the mask and the reference to the model borrowed from the arm, from the anonymous, from a general type of femininity that is already crystallized in public life, together constitute the main building blocks of the male-to-female to, to male to female transsexual condition. For Sartre, one can never coincide with oneself because one is always at a distance from oneself. One can never become a fixed self, somebody in the substantive sense. One is always one's desire, lack of being, one's possible, rather than an actual entity with substance and structure, a thing, a pure in itself. Here, in the transsexual's case, not always, but in many cases, at least as I consider the subjects I've encountered in my clinical experience, 
their whole being becomes completely absorbed, fixed by their gender issue that becomes substantialized and by which they resolve them, they resolve them themselves, putrefying the annihilation of the for itself. If it is true that as some stated in a search for a method, language and culture are not inside the individual like stamps registered by his nervous system, it is the individual is inside culture and inside language, then male to female transsexual pre verbal inner experiences regarding gender identity are signified just within that horizon of meaning opened up by the signifier of sexual difference, which is a culturally and therefore historically determined horizon. It is within this field that we may unequivocally place this picking out about this and their expressive body determinations. In other words, in this case, consciousness may direct its own egos and noematic relative as a self-representation, define its qualities solely and exclusively on the basis of what the social says about the feminine. Now, let's consider the importance of the intersubjective space, which, as I said before, Sartre identifies as the fundamental way to define ourselves as male, female, or everything else. In his being nothingness, he begins his discussion of concrete relations with others by claiming that we can have two distinct basic attitudes towards another person. In the former, he says, the subject attempts to get the other person to affirm that he does indeed have a fixed nature. He describes this as an attempt to assimilate the other to his project of seeing himself in a certain way. Well, I think that this attitude is clearly evident in many cases of M to F transsexual subjects. The significance of the gaze and what occurs in the body image here is quite clear. Within the intersubjective space, self-mirroring finds a specific eventuality at the world level. Now, if in the certain system the gaze is essentially alienating, the other, at least in B and nothingness, is seen to represent a necessary threat to one's identity, well, here we find that exactly as it states in the chapter entitled Concrete Relations with Others, the other is often used instrumentally to satisfy the need to confirm one's own existence or self-declaration. It is indeed in the case of the other that M to F transsexual in many cases seeks a prosthetic support, a constant and necessary source of confirmation of her own self-declaration, self-display, and therefore of her assumed identity. Katie, the person previously mentioned, stated, I like to show off. I like it because I have achieved the confidence and the peace of mind that allow me to do that. I like to be watched. And arousing desire and excitement in others, especially in men, is something that I enjoy and that I find intriguing. Well, it is true that for all of us, the desire-fueled gaze of the other is always an important element in defining our own gender identity. As Sartre writes, my first apprehension of the others having a sex does not come when I conclude from the distribution of his air, from the coarseness of his hands, the sound of his voice, the strength that is of the masculine sex. We are dealing here, Sartre writes, with derived conclusions which refer to an original state, the first apprehension of the other's sexuality insofar as, it, insofar as it, is, it is lived and suffered can be only desire. It is by desiring the other or by apprehending his desire for me that I discover his being sexed. Desire reveals to me simultaneously my being sexed and his being sexed, my body is sex and his body. In any case, what is at stake here in the transsexual case in an, is an anthropological lack of proportion in Binswangerian theory. The transsexual individual exists her own sexual body by erecting it as an index of her being within the intersubjective space as a body molded, unfurling wholly on the level of the imaginary. The realizing action of this register is in this case effectively targeted at the modification of one's own bodily appearance, motivated precisely by the body, body's nature as a body offered to the gaze. As Roberta said, I get pissed off if 
people stand me, but I get even more pissed off. They don't look at me. I stare at myself in the mirror a lot. I feel that I'm special and I want others to notice I'm special. It would bother me if I went unnoticed. I would feel frustrated. So, evidently, what is achieved through a surgically modified body is individuals who undergo such modifications often say is finally the chance to manage to look, to look at oneself in the mirror, to find oneself, to make the reflected image coincide. But, at the same time, a mimetic transformation is also functional to the need to reclaim oneself through the gaze of others. The imperative to find oneself in the design field gaze of the altar reduced to a double reflection after the more or less successful cancellation of last vestiges of ambiguity. Returning once again to Sartre, in many cases it is an attempt to use the other to totalize the detotalized totality which I am, so as to close the open circle and finally to be my own foundation, a perfect, ideal woman beyond femininity itself, to be woman with capital W, not a woman. The reconstitution of the image in the mirror achieved by suppressing male bodily signs therefore finds its deepest motivation in the finally realized feminization of the reflected image, something that initially had only been glimpsed in the gaze of others. What is achieved here closely resembles how Sartre describes the young Gustave Flaubert's experience. This is what Sartre had to say. If Gustave wants to be a woman, it is because his partially feminine sexuality calls out for a change of sex that would allow him fully to develop his resources. He wishes himself to be an imaginary woman. I should say that his first intention is to view himself in the mirror as a woman. Is this impossible? Yes and no. Of course, without makeup, we cannot see a reflected image of a girl rather than a little boy is. And yet, at the cost of a double irrealization, we can imagine that another is caressing a real woman himself on the far side of the mirror. There are two analogues here, his end and his image. These two resistances, that of the reflection and that of the body in which it was serving, mutually accusing one another of making the attempt fail. If he was completely, completely the other, he would be the woman that he sees in the mirror, Therefore, she is there. All it takes to see her is to realize himself just a little more. If the reflection allowed itself to become fully feminized, Gustave would be another person that the manly hands fondly him. He would be, in the end, down there, the absolute object of this caresses retreat, internalizing it as troubled flesh, a rapid and excessive shuttling from one insufficiency to next will allow him to conceive the plenitude of illusion as accessible and even during brief tension-filled moments to imagine that has been achieved. End of the quotation. Well, very similarly, Antonello is another person interviewed by Papa Ryan Marcaciano says, I look at myself in the mirror and it is there in front of the mirror that it all happens. What a disaster it would be if there was no such, such thing as a mirror. The difference between Luisa and Antonello is only in the moment that I get ready. It's in front of the mirror that they meet and trade places. Antonello takes a rest and Luisa wakes up. When I take my makeup off, it's Luisa who goes to sleep. Goes to sleep. In any event, in many cases, the two parts coexist, they merge and lose themselves in one another, and sometimes they clash. Well, now the price paid may seem extremely high. Indeed, making oneself the other in one's own gaze is doomed to failure, but not for that, uh, sorry, but not for that to be abundant. On the contrary, it constantly returns to the fore in an infinite series of worldly encounters, or in, in, the, in the individual's image reconstituted in the mirror. A necessary consequence is the ever-present risk of annulling any real and deep coexistentive encounter, an authentic dialogic dimension. Furthermore, as Sartre pointed out correctly in his being nothingness, we're always in a state of instability in relation to the other. 
Now, in the case of a transsexual, this means that her relationship with the other is very, very risky. The other than self-known inert nature and the indi individual's dependency on his or her gaze, the enigmatic and disorienting nature of the alter ego, as Zilasi defines it, often makes it a potential source, source of threat in the M2F transsexual's mind. Another subject quoted by Alessandro Salvino, the Italian professor of clinical psychology, well, this, this subject says, those who are outside the door waiting to judge me can make me feel like a fully successful woman or as, as if I have some original manufacturing defect. Furthermore, the sexual encounter itself may be at risk or become a troubling experience. Just as Katie says, Sometimes I thought that my partner was staying with me just looking for my male genitalia. This really upset me because I felt like a woman. But if the other was looking for my masculine side, it automatically demolished, cancelled my perception of myself. This thought was a kind of maggot that has gnawed in me for years. It is a problem that I often find myself facing that the homosexuality of my partner could neutralize my being a woman. What is at issue here is that only in a space where, she see, where she's able to see her own object image confirmed that an M2F transsexual seems able to find peace with the other. It is only the, in the accommodating gaze of the altar that in many cases her anxiety, anxiety may be assuaged, at least up to a certain point. As we have seen, the words of interviewees quoted above, the former membership of the male gender cannot, for obvious reasons, ever be completely expunged. Vice versa, it will remain as constantly and potentially re-implementable, unmaskable elements. A tragic antinomy is therefore set up in such cases in, on an existential level. If, on the one hand, the other is, the other is established, as a constant source of threat on the, other, on the other, the other's case is important for the identity stabilizing process. The problem is that a life like this is not always so easy to manage. For example, Nicole had this to say. There are times when you would like to be quiet, alone, normal, invisible. Moments when you feel the need to be alone with yourself, to observe the world with the same eyes and in the same ways as ordinary mortals, and instead we are almost forced to be seen through binoculars, always trained on us, like a big brother that affects our privacy and touches the nerves. It's like being constantly on stage with an audience in front of you. Well, I think that beyond what is commonly said and written in newspapers, on television, or sometimes even within specialist publications dedicated to the subject, the transsexual experience is very, very hard, even before considering the social aspects of the phenomenon I have not discussed here. What I have tried to do in my research is to better articulate their way of being, trying to understand the existential a priori that marks out this condition, the very categories that make the anchoring and orientation in the life world possible. Certainly, as you have seen, Jean Poulsen's thought has been very, very useful for my purpose. I hope I have been able to throw at least some light on the transsexual issue, to reveal it in its complexity, if you will, in its dramatic nature. Thank you very much. <laughs>